Muito bom dia a todos. Bom, é um, um gosto e um privilégio e uma honra para mim estar aqui a apresentar o, o professor Fonseca de Moura, que é doutor honoris causa da nossa universidade desde, desde segunda-feira e que é uma, uma pessoa extraordinária. Eu, eu só o conheci pessoalmente na segunda-feira. E, portanto, eu digo que é uma pessoa extraordinária e não ia referir a parte curricular do o professor Fonseca de Moura, enfim, que é do conhecimento de todos nós, mas ia só referir um aspecto que, de facto, me apercebi quando o conheci, nestes dias, e que eu acho que é o único. O, o professor Fonseca de Moura saiu do técnico, foi professor do técnico até 1986, que foi o ano em que eu entrei no técnico. Já agora temos esse ponto em comum, ele saiu e eu entrei, talvez não estivéssemos ainda, eu entrei como aluno, e ele saiu para o MIT, porque, nas suas palavras, tinha lido um livro de mecânica de materiais chamado Timoshenko, chamado Timoshenko, não, chama-se Mechanics of Materials, e o autor é o Timoshenko, que era professor do MIT, eu ouvi essa história. Da... E o Timoshenko também é um livro que me diz muito, porque, de facto, é um livro que eu tenho gravado aqui há alguns... Uh, na, na, na minha... aqui, aqui na, na, no meu, não só porque é um livro muito difícil, porque o formalismo é muito difícil, mecânica racional, como a primeira unidade curricular que eu dei foi precisamente mecânica de materiais, dei com o professor Manuel Amaral Fortes, que talvez o professor Fonseca de Moura tenha conhecido, que também era um formalista e, e ele obrigava os seus assistentes, eu em particular, a saber o Timoshenko todo de, de ponta a ponta, e enfim. Bom, já passou. Quem, uh, quem consegue fazer isso com o Timoshenko depois fica preparado para muita coisa na vida. E, 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 bom, não foi mal todo. Mas, portanto, a, a razão, porque eu só anoto aqui o caridade e vou-me vou já uh, aqui calar, porque vocês estão aqui para ouvir o professor Fonseca de Moura e não o presidente do técnico, mas a, a razão do, do, da parte extraordinária que eu uh, me apercebi no, no professor Fonseca de Moura é que ele saiu do técnico em, em 1986, como eu estava a dizer, há, há 35 anos, um, para os Estados Unidos, ou seja, para o lado lá do Atlântico, e apesar disso, manteve uma ligação e um conhecimento ao técnico que muitos de nós, que estamos aqui todos os dias há 35 anos, não têm. E isso, de facto, é extraordinário. E isto é mesmo real. Eu falei com, com o professor Fonseca de Moura no meu gabinete durante um bocado e, e vi que ele sabe mais do técnico quase do que o próprio presidente do técnico e sabe detalhes. Então, já viu aquele que foi... Ah, sim, não sabia. Isso é uma coisa extraordinária. De facto, nunca tinha visto isto em ninguém. E isto é aquilo, é uma coisa que eu digo sempre, que tenho dito sempre há muitos anos aos meus alunos, e imagino que muitos de vós uh, digam também, que é, quando saem do técnico, nunca saiam do técnico, regressem sempre porque o técnico nunca sai de dentro de vós. E o professor Fonseca de Moura é o exemplo disso, uma pessoa que saiu, mas que nunca deixou que o técnico, a sua alma mata, saísse de dentro dele. Muito obrigado, professor. assumed the role of uh, being a, a moderator of this uh, session without knowing exactly how to do it. So we will do the things in, according to the running of the, the works. Uh, as you see, the speaker is going to tell us a story. And uh, uh, at the end, or after that, I, I will also uh, tell some some. Well, some things, and a, so a short story, which has to do certainly what uh, uh, you are going to say. So I, I do not delay the things and uh, give the word. The word. <coughs> oh. 
Ok. Muito obrigado, professor Colasso, pelas suas palavras e obrigado também pela hospitalidade do técnico e pela cerimónia de segunda-feira, que uh, estou muito agradecido e, embora eu acho que não tivesse merecido a cerimónia nem as palavras da professora Isabel Ribeiro, estou, de facto, muito agradecido pelo, uh, pelo técnico. Uh, professor Leitão, muito obrigado. Ora bem, uh, a professora Isabel Ribeiro disse-me ah, sim, há uma, a gente vai te dar uma coisa, mas tu também tens que fazer alguma coisa. E, portanto, eu tive que passar umas horas largas a pensar o que é que havia de ser. E uh, dei dois tópicos à professora Isabel Ribeiro, uma que seria um, um tópico técnico e o outro que seria, como o professor Leitão acabou de dizer, uma história. E a professora Isabel Ribeiro respondeu a história definitivamente. E, portanto, eu peço desculpa àqueles que estão aqui para, para vir a, a, a pensar que vêm para uma, 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 uma conversa técnica, porque não, praticamente não há, não, há, não, há nenhum, não, há, não há ciência atrás do que eu vou dizer, há mais uma história um, que se tece. Um, portanto, era, era isso que eu queria dizer. Um, tinha outra coisa interessante para dizer, mas talvez me recorde daqui a bocadinho. Uh, no dia 2, no dia uh, 17, uh, I'm sorry, I have to speak in English, because uh, I know there are a few people uh, out there. So, oh, the, the thing I wanted to say also is that some of you might suddenly find that you are 35, 40 years back in time, because some of you have been my students, okay? <laughs> And because I left a few years back, some of you must be having a nightmare today, but I'm sorry. <laughs> We are really in 2021. So anyway, on February 17, 2016, exactly at 4 p.m., and the time is because of the closing of the Wall Street. So when the Wall Street closed at 4 p.m., Carnegie Mellon University and Marvel Technology Group Limited announced that they had reached a settlement. And that's the, the news. Uh, both both uh, uh, went uh, to the to the news with the, exactly the same same announcement, and so uh, that's not the, the full announcement. But it says Carnegie Mellon University and Marvel Technology Group Limited today announced that they have settled the patent infringement lawsuit the university filed in 2009. Settlement includes an aggregate payment by the company to the university. And then, 25, 22 minutes and 55 seconds later, the president of uh, Carnegie Mellon, Subra Suresh, uh, 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 sent an email to the community of Carnegie Mellon, like a tweet, I don't know if it was a tweet, uh, or an email maybe, and of course for the general public, where uh, the email said that uh, confirmed the settlement And then was very nice to the co-inventors um, because it said that uh, uh, those individuals whose breakthrough research and innovation, see, it? The, having the president of your university talking about breakthrough research, we feel proud and uh, enthusiastic. Okay, um, and we are proud of their work and all the outstanding, and then uh, said, uh, referred to the outstanding research at Carnegie Mellon's College of Engineering, Department of Electrical Engineering, and the Data Storage System Center, which laid the foundation for this industry innovation and global impact. And, uh, and Sura Suresh, oh, this is, uh, I enlarged it. Okay, so what I'm gonna tell you is a little bit of a story, and the story spans many years, okay? The, the story spans, depending on where, where you start, If it started when I joined CMU, that would spend 30 years. If, uh, if, uh, if uh, I, I, I say, well, let's put the start line when the Data Storage System Center uh, started their work, that is about 25 years, okay? But if I go back to my own ideas regarding uh, related to this, I could actually go even back And uh, I don't know if Miss Rendas is around. She's not, she must be asleep. Uh, it's too early in the morning. And her uh, master's thesis 
we did in a completely different, uh, different um, um, uh, context the ingredients that underlie this solution, okay? So things, things uh, uh, as Professor Lito used to say, science is like a tautology, repeats itself, okay, in different forms, and I think that these things, these things do happen. So what I will try to do is uh, to walk you through this, this, uh, this. But first, let me give you the context, okay? Because uh, uh, these things are much more interesting. If we place ourselves back in '86, in the, in the night, in the early, in the late '80s, in the in the early '90s, and we look at, in this particular case, at the U.S. industry, okay? And uh, the U.S. industry was in a real crisis, and the the the, the crisis was due to the Jap Japan resurgence, okay? And if you go back and you think what happened in the 70s and 80s, well, the household appliances. Who was the dominant household appliance in the 50s and the 60s? It was the U.S. industry. Who was they? The, they were all the brands were practically replaced by Japanese brands, okay? But if you look at another, another uh, very interesting example, like the electronics uh, industry, uh, I'll remind you of a few names that some of you might still remember, okay? The Philco, Sylvania, Emerson, Motorola, RCA, Westinghouse, Admiral, GE, Magnavox, and I could continue. These are all names, brand, brand names of TV sets in the 60s and early 70s. But then, if you put yourself in the 80s, the names you find is Itachi, Mitsubishi, Ele Mitsubishi Electric, Sanyo, Sharp, Toshiba. And even these names don't, uh, don't remind us of anything because now it's Samsung and whatever else, Korean, Korean industry. So in the, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, the U.S. was looking at their in industrial base, <laughs> and what was it? It was withering away, and the automobile industry. Okay, the the, the three giants uh, of Detroit were being replaced by Toyota, by uh, uh, Nissan, and by others. Okay, and then the most critical example in the early 80s is the semiconductor industry. Okay, semiconductor industry that itself uh, manufactures the chips that are used by all these other industries. Okay, so if the semiconductor industry was also withering away in the U.S., then the manufacturing base of the U.S. faced a major crisis. And this is really, and just to give you an example, just to give you an example, uh, I have all these dates there. In one specific uh, example, which is what's called the memory, the, the memory, but it's not the, the magnetic recording memory, is the memory in the CPU, in the computational unit, okay? That was uh, invented uh, in, uh, in the 1918 or 20 by Jay Forrester, and then keep going, keep going, and then uh, you get to the sick, 1964, and someone at IBM invents one of those memories, like today, to, uh, 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 the, the memory to store the, day, the data very close to the CPU to be used using transistors. Uh, so that's in 1964. And then the, uh, there are a bunch of others. And this one, then at, the, at IBM, invents then this, uh, using MOS technology, for those of you that know semiconductors, you know that MOS and then CMOS is the technology that has dominated the devices since uh, the, the uh, late, uh, late 60s and, and the 70s. But you, if you went through all this, you'd see that uh, you start with uh, one bit and then uh, 1,000 bit, and uh, for example, in 73, you are already at 4,000 bits, and uh, uh, these are all people connected to the US. IBM here and someone, uh, someone else there. In um, 1976, and, and you see the progression, one bit, four bits, uh, 4,000 bits, 16,000 bits, uh, the technology now is called DRAM, I, I'm not gonna go into this, has the 16,000 bits, and this is very fast. 
one new technology appears and immediately takes over the market. Okay, so for example, the 16,000 bits, which is three years after the 4,000 bits, already has 75% of the market. Okay, and, and it's clear because if I'm a manufacturer and I want to use uh, uh, to fabricate computers, I'm going to use the best technology, and the numbers are increasing, growing, growing. So in three years' time, you go and capture. 75%. Uh, you keep going in the 80s, early 80s, 64,000 bits, except that the 64,000 bits is no longer a US manufacturer, is a Japanese manufacturer. And then they start dominating the US worldwide markets. Okay? And uh, Intel, for example, that uh, had introduced in 1970 uh, th these uh, uh, MOS technology for memory, in 1970, dominating the market and so forth, in 1980, uh, 1986, uh, in 1985, Gordon Moore, the present uh, co-founder of Intel, is overwhelmed by the Japanese and decides Intel is no longer going to be in the DRAM market, the market that they created, basically. Okay, the commercial market technology was invented at IBM, but the commercial market is was Intel's market just five years ago, ten years ago, and so this is what's happening in the 80s. Okay, the context, um, and then of course the Japanese were overwhelmed by the by the by 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 the Koreans, Samsung, Samsung. In 1992, came with another memory device that has now 16 million. Now, just think, this is 64,000. This, in 76, is 16,000. In 1992, about uh, 16 years later, it's 1,000-fold more, okay? And, and the, the, the pattern repeats. US, Jap Japan, Korean. As exactly on the TV market, in the semiconductor market. So this is, let's say, the, the context. And so the semiconductor industry was really overwhelmed. And this is taken from a history of uh, the Semiconductor Research Corporation. Now, you have to understand that industry, uh, the, the, the companions, the companies in industry are all very competitive. But in the US, they realized, the IBMs, the Intels, the, all the others uh, in the semiconductor industry, they realized that they were being eaten by the Japanese, and later, of course, by, the, by Korea. Okay, and so they decided in 1982, going against all the monopolic uh, experiences and all that, to form a consortium, which is the Semiconductor Research uh, Corporation. Okay, and this is taken from, from uh, the uh, history that I found uh, actually yesterday, uh, and I, I uh, because I wanted to make sure that you understand I'm not inventing this, okay? This is what they say. And in 1982, they say, in the late 70s and into the next decade, the American semiconductor industry had been witnessing a rapid erosion of its technological leadership, and goes on and on and on, okay? So they decided to form this, this is the semiconductor research, this is the semiconductor industry, the chips, okay? The Intels of the world, the IBMs of the world. And, uh, and so this is the context. And uh, they start, uh, this SRC start uh, um, supporting research at universities. So they start at, at a very large, very large, uh, um, and they, they founded, they, they, they supported centers. And uh, when I got to CMU in 86, 84, they had uh, supported uh, this uh, SRC, uh, Center of Excellence in Computer Aided Design, it was one at Berkeley and the other at, uh, at CMU, and these two lasted uh, till 1996. So it lasted 12 years with continuous support at a very large multi-million dollar per year. Per year. So this is the context. The, this is the context. And then uh, here is the timeline just to place. Uh, I'm sorry that I, it says there, Dr. Moore. This is because I stole these slides from the, the lawyers, okay, and the lawyers treat people with respect, okay? Not as your students, <laughs> they treat you with respect. So they say, okay, I arrived in, in 86, in 86, and what happens? What happens is that the US Congress, everybody is looking at the, the shrinking basis of the US manufacturing. 
what is an industry in high tech that is still out there, still dominated by the US, is the recording, magnetic recording industry. Now we are talking about the magnetic disks, no longer the DRAM, okay? The DRAM is the fast memory close to the CPU devices. The DRAM is like the parking lot where you store your data, okay? And then it's a very slow re recover when you read from the data. And uh, magnetic recording had a history at CMU. CMU, for some reason, over the years, people had, uh, had re re um, recruited from the industry experts in magnetic recording. And I put here Stan Cherub because he really is 1968. He has some interesting contributions. But I really want to talk about 1978 when CMU recruited Mark Kreider from IBM. Okay, so Mark Kreider comes to IBM. He's an expert uh, in, uh, the, the, in the magnetic disks, magnetic heads that read in the materials. He's a physicist, okay? Has an interesting story. Let's not go into that. But he joined CMU uh, in 1978. Now, because he comes from industry and he's uh, someone with a vision, he says, well, um, I want to form an industry consortia that supports my research. Okay, that's the best thing to do. He looks at the SRC example, so he copies the model and starts uh, putting together workshops where he brings not the top management of the companies, he brings the maybe the second or third level, the people that really develop the technology, the disk drives. Okay, so he brings those people and he starts talking the talking about the technology. And they all agree that the, the industry is facing a crisis. They look at the examples and they say, we are doomed unless we do something. And the something that Mark Ryder tells them is, we need a consortium of you competitive manufacturers, but we will look beyond your two, three years time span. We'll look at more, uh, more, more medium term. And, uh, and uh, if you do that, Maybe we all, you can collaborate among yourselves and with us, and maybe we will be successful. We'll help you to be successful, and we will be successful. So in 1983, he, he formed a, um, the Ma a Magnetic Technology Center. He convinced IBM and 3M. 3M is also a company you may, now, of course, you only remember 3M because of those uh, yellow yellow stickers, right? But, uh, but uh, they were disk drives. They, had, uh, they were very much uh, into the high-tech technology. Uh, and he convinces them in 1983, if you extrapolate that to today's dollars, it's a lot, each of them to contribute $750,000 per year. Okay, so Mark Kreider is really a smart guy. And then he convinced Seagate at a lower level, Kodak, Digital Equipment Corporation. I don't know if any one of you remembers Digital Equipment Corporation, but that was the big company in the 80s, okay? The mini computers in the 90s and so forth disappeared, of course, and many others. So he formed this Magna Magnet Technology Center. Four years later, IBM recognizes and, uh, and uh, I say IBM, but now I must say the industry generically, they recognize that uh, um, the solution is not just in the materials of the magnetic uh, disks, it's a system level. And by system level, I mean it's the materials, of which Mark Ryder is an expert, or people like him, it's the heads, the heads are the little things that, that fly around and and recover the, the voltage signal from the magnetic recordings. It's, again, it's a physicist kind of thing and material science uh, kind of expertise, but they also need things that move very fast, control positioning, and also the recovery of the data, the detections. So they, they say, okay, we need, they, found, they formed this workshop in 87, they brought people, and. I remember, I'm at CMU now, and Mark Ryder said, Jose, why don't you come along to San Jose? San Jose or San Jose? San Jose, that's what they say. But, but he did say, Jose, why don't you come along? So I went along, and of course, uh, I saw all these tremendous experts from, every, from all, all sides of the industry, and uh, I, I, I did not even know how to talk to them, because this was a, a totally foreign foreign problem to me. But uh, uh, one year later in 87, no, in 87 later, 
uh, Mark Ryder decides to put a team together, I was part of that, to then propose to NSF a major effort, NSF National Science Foundation, to, to put a major effort in building a disk drive. So bringing all the technologies together that would leapfrog uh, the, 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 what the companies were doing by a factor of five. That was his goal. In five years, we will leapfrog where the industry will be in five years will be five times uh, larger in terms of what can be recorded. And that was a convergence of different technologies. So he put the team together, went to, to NSF in 87. We got a, a site visit, which means we passed several levels of the review process, but eventually people uh, did not award him. And uh, there, there are some interesting side stories about that, but it doesn't matter. In two years later, Mark Wright put again the proposal, now with all the wisdom he learned from the first rejection, and then the, 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 the proposal uh, um, was successful. And in 1990, this data storage system center, which is an, a National Science Foundation engineering research center, had a promise of five years of very large government funding uh, that could that could be extended if successful by the end of the third year, uh, uh, extended from five to eight, and by the end of the sixth year could go up to 11 years. So it was almost 11 years of promise of, of research funding at the high level, which gives to everyone, as you know, at universities, with a time horizon of up to 11 years, lets you think bolder and grandiose rather than the companies two and three years. And the DSSC is a consortia of government funding with industry funding, okay? The IBMs and all that, he, he converted the MTC into the D, DSSC, and so he had this company with both, with both. Okay, so that's what's going on. And, uh, um, and then in my timeline, uh, again, stealing the thing from the lawyers, uh, they say here that uh, uh, the DSSC has formed, and then uh, uh, 1993 is when my student, Alec Kavchik, is recruited. He arrives at CMU in, uh, in uh, September 1993, and then uh, in early 96, that's when we say that we conceived of some, some invention, and then we filed uh, uh, to, to, with respect to CMU what's called the disclosure of invention. You have to, if you want to patent some technology, you have to first tell you to your boss, to your, the place where you work, we claim that we invented this, and then you have to convince them to spend about $20,000 to file for a patent. And you must uh, understand that universities don't have $20,000 just around the corner, okay? But for some reason, they agreed to do that, and then, uh, uh, one year later, so this is May, is a provisional. You have one year, up to one year to file a patent, uh, uh, to file a, a real patent, okay? After you file a provisional. So we filed it about one year later. You'll see it's April while the other was May. And then, uh, and then that's it. And uh, this is uh, the, patent, the patents even, that eventually um, um, were issued by the United States Patent uh, and trademark office, USPTO. And the, the, there are two patents. One issued uh, in uh, maybe in March 2001. So we filed in 98, 97, so four years later. And then, and this goes, the number is very large. The number is all this, all these digits here, but uh, uh, in legal terms, they only use the last three names. So this became the 839 patent. And the other one, that issued that was filed by us uh, in 99, not in 98, but 99. But because this we claimed was a continuation of the other patent, you can claim that that technology goes back to 97. That's uh, something. And this again is referred as the 180 patent, okay? And these two cover the detection, and I'll explain that, the detection algorithm that we proposed uh, uh, or that we developed uh, um, into the SSC, uh, with the DSSC. So that's, that's the timeline. So we filed the, pro the provision, the final patent application in 98, and then uh, the 839 is in 2001, 
and uh, the 180s in 2002. So that's, that's the, the, the preliminaries, let's say. So let me explain a little bit so you have an idea what the technology is. Of course, this is, uh, uh, um, and, uh, and uh, again, these are all slides stolen from the, uh, the, the, the trial. So this goes back to 2012. The technology has evolved in the last nine years. Uh, but uh, I'm putting myself in the context uh, of uh, 2012. And uh, these are the principles. This is what I'm talking about, okay? It's these hard disk drives, okay? And the hard disk drives, of course, has a disk that rotates at high speed. And so you have the, the magnetic disk, and then you have this head that reads, and uh, you record the disks, uh, you record the, the data along these, in these circular tracks, and uh, now if you, uh, cut the, the circuit and you s straight line them, this is more or less conceptually what it is, okay? You, you have magnetic domains. It's like a little, little magnetic um, pole, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, magnetic uh, whatever, that has the north and south poles. And so you put uh, them together like that. And so the, uh, if you have zeros, consecutive zeros, maybe there is no flip of the, the there is no transition. Uh, actually, there is a transition because it goes north, south, but they attract. so. There is no repulsion there, but when there is a, a zero to one, then uh, you switch the, the direction of the magnetization. So where it was, say, uh, north-south, north-south, it becomes north-south, south-north, and south-north it repels, okay? And, uh, and uh, so this is, uh, and uh, in, the, in the 80s, with, uh, with the, uh, the, the number of bits that were being compressed in this disk, were not that many, and so you didn't need a, a lot of uh, detection smarts to be able to read accurately the data. So this is what we are talking about when we talk about the chip that is going to process the signal read by this, this head, okay? So this reads, it's like a microphone, you talk to the microphone, but this is a transducer for a voltage signal. So there is a voltage signal there, and then voltage signal uh, is sampled, uh, so you read some, uh, some levels there, and then you process that, and you say it's a zero, it's a one, okay? That's, that's, and that resides there. And that's where we claim that the infringement, the, the, the algorithm that we developed was, was, uh, uh, was implemented in, in these little chips, okay, by, by Marvell. Okay, so uh, just for you to have a, uh, an idea, this is like uh, a human hair, okay? And uh, I said we recorded the magnetic domains here, but then uh, we have another little circle. And so how many circles? Well, think of a human hair. Human hair is about four, uh, 50 microns. 50 microns means one millimeter has about 20 human hairs. Roughly, could be 10, could be 10, could be 20, could be 100. But that's roughly what we are talking about. And at that time, there were about two dozen such tracks in a human hair. So that gives you an idea of the dimension, of the dimension uh, across, across the tracks. Uh, linearly along the tracks, you could, uh, uh, with the technology at the time, or the, what we claimed, that we would be able to do in the 1990s was about 100,000 to 200,000 per inch, which means 2.5 centimeters. Okay, I, don't, I didn't make the, the computation to decimals, but that's what it is. It would be two, 200,000 magnetic domains in this called linear, linear uh, direction, and then across it would be about 2,000 tracks, okay, per 2,000 tracks per human hair. Okay, so what we, what we promised and the actual evolution of what the magnetic uh, industry, what, uh, well, what DSSC proved and, uh, and then the, the disk drive industry along the years start implementing was great technology to record the data, okay? The magnetic material developments and the read the right head and the read head. The technologies allowed them to store an amount of data that was exponentially increasing. Okay, this this follows uh, Moore's law on the semiconductors, except that 
the disk drive actually was much faster than the Moore's law, and the, we actually call the equivalent the Crider's law. Okay, there is a Moore's law, and for those that uh, the, uh, the more into this business, they call the Crider's law. The Crider's law was faster than Moore's law, which means that. And now you know that exponentials uh, are a little bit tricky because if uh, if I if I look at an exponential from here to there, I get almost the same pattern, okay? Exponential has no memory. So it's, uh, it, uh, if, you, if you start it later, it comes ag again to be very flat and then there is a knee and goes up. But uh, this is what happens. So if you put yourself in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, it's like, okay, you are here. And if you are 10 years later or 15 years later, you are gonna get this explosion. Okay, and so that gives you visually an idea of the difficulty of actually recovering, reading. If you, re if you record uh, your ID number today or yesterday in a disk, of course, you want it to be the same tomorrow. You don't want it to be someone else's uh, ID number. And so that's the challenge when you start shrinking the magnetic domains where you can record these things, okay? so. This gives you a visual, a visual. And another visual is this. Uh, if you go back to 1956, this is the first disk drive that IBM commercialized. Uh, it, it even doesn't give you the, the idea because it doesn't put you this in the room, but it's a large room filled by this single, and maybe it has uh, 64,000 bytes or something in memory, okay? And of course, in 2010, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, these uh, laptops, and we are talking about terabytes, okay? And of course, in 2021, uh, I didn't check, but maybe we are at the five terabyte uh, little, little device. So that's, that's the shrinking that gives you the idea that domains are, the, the, the magnetic uh, experts can shrink the magnetic domains. Can, uh, uh, there are lots of little stories about that, but uh, let's not uh, go into that. And so here is uh, what happens when you start shrinking. Those little rectangle squares that seems to have very sharp boundaries between the magnetic domains actually are, they, they are not that, uh, that sharp. And as you start shrinking, the domains start interacting, okay? And that's the problem. They shrink in size, and on the other hand, uh, as the magnetic uh, head, the uh, uh, right or read head flies over this, there is a lot of noise, and the noise starts becoming of a different characteristic from what people like me working in these things usually assumes to design uh, detectors. And so uh, just to, to have a, another visual, um, this is like reading a, uh, reading a book, okay? The letters are big, you can read the book, you are happy, okay? Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, but uh, as you start putting more and more data, creaming is like shrinking the size. But uh, okay, uh, this is what, what happens. The letters are well delineated. There is a slight, uh, a slight variation at the boundaries, but that's fine. Now you start uh, putting more and more, and uh, they start becoming very small. You put some glasses or magnifying glasses, and you can still read. Okay, so this is like a detector, a simple detector. Okay, a magnifying glass can read, you can still read. And uh, now you start getting this more and more data and not even the magnifying glass can help you read. And so you need something better, maybe a microscope, but reading a book with the microscope is kind of awkward. But anyway, this illustrates how the magnetic uh, experts what they were doing. They were cramming things, and so making more, more and more difficult to recover the data, to read back the data. Okay, so this is a, vis a visual, and uh, what we had to do, so we, uh, me, I was charged in the SSE, come in and uh, help us design the detectors. Uh, we had other colleagues trying to do the same thing. Uh, they had the advantage of knowing a lot because my colleagues already worked on that for a number of years with the SSC. I was, I came fresh. And I think that sometimes the advantage becomes a disadvantage because you are the naive person. 
and you go to all these workshops and they give all the talks and you don't understand. Okay, so what I decided when I recruited uh, Alec Kavchik was when Alec joined, he was eager to develop array processing algorithms and the latest signal processing algorithms and so forth. And I said, Alec, that's very good and very great. He came from, a, a, he graduated from a university in Germany. I knew very well his advisor. I took a lot of care in recruiting a student uh, for that uh, fall of 1993. It was gonna be my only student supported by the SSC, so I was very careful. Uh, there is an interesting tidbit there. I had to call the advisor. We talked over the phone. He gave me the greatest guarantee, so I recruited Alec. Alec came, he was brilliant, and he wanted to develop uh, array processing algorithms, okay? And I said, Alec, that's great, but that's not for that that uh, you are here. You first have to go and uh, take all the possible courses that are taught on magnetics, okay? All the possible courses, go to the physics department, go to the courses that Kreider teaches, that uh, Lambda this teaches, every single course that you have to. That's not what I came here for. I know you, you didn't come for that, but before you really want to do what you want to do, you need to know the problem. And that's, it was not easy, it was not easy because uh, Alec is, uh, as um, some of my former students, some sitting in front of me that are very stubborn and they know better. But I convinced in very nice ways, Isabel, actually, in very nice ways that they really wanted to learn <laughs> magnetic, uh, the, the process that Kreider, whatever Kreider was doing, okay? And why, why that? Because what I said is, I can't compete with the, the IBM experts. I can't compete even with my colleagues here at CMU. So I have to bite the bullet, stay silent for a number of years, and maybe Alec will come up with a great idea, not for today, but for maybe 10 years from now, okay? But to do that, I have to understand the micromagnetic modeling, okay? And so someone needs to go and understand that. I. I really wasn't motivated for that, so I convinced Alec to be motivated, and he, he went, okay? And he liked it, and he became an expert. He, he was very smart, he beat all the other students, he was always the first in all these other courses. So he, we start trying to understand micromagnetic modeling, and so we start simulating these things, okay? These boundaries as we shrink more and more and more. And then we developed a model for that, a model, a complicated model, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, when doing that, we understood something. We understood that the noise, for those of you now, sorry about that, that develop communication systems, the usual model that goes back to Shannon and Wiener and all those people, is you add to the signal a noise component. And you assume the noise is what's called white noise. Okay, so independent and all those, those nice characteristics. Now, it turned out that the noise induced by this on the voltage signal read back by the read, read head was not, could not satisfy well that, that model. So we had to come up, and so that's why we went micromodeling uh, this. But micromodeling means you put a supercomputer at the time, and of course you couldn't do the model resulting from that you couldn't put on the chip for the disk. But uh, as things happen, you step back and you realize that the most important thing is that the noise itself was not independent from sample to sample like the white noise. And more, than, more importantly, it depended on the actual signal that you record. And let me explain why. You see here, if I have a sequence of zeros, the boundaries are very sharp, the noise must be small, okay? If you have a sequence of ones, the noise must be small in the, at the transition. But if you start getting a one and a zero and a one, you see what happens? The noise must be very large. And this means it depends, the noise is going to depend on what you record, on the data that you record. And in communications, in your cell phone, nobody ever assumes that, okay? And so that was the challenge. Um, I'm not gonna, and so in terms of the, the detectors that industry war use, 
In the 80s, when things were separate, very sharp boundaries, they use a very simple one, which is called a peak detector. If the voltage is above a threshold, you say it's a one. If it's below the threshold, you say it's a zero. Very simple. And then in 1990, when they start seeing that things, the peak detector, because what's called signal to noise ratio was becoming smaller, they said, OK, we have to go to a different technology. And they went to the Viterbi sequence detector, OK? IBM came up with a product in 1990. You see that the, the industry was not sleeping. The industry was improving their own uh, at a very fast pace. But they were, but I was looking five or 10 years ahead, and I knew that the Viterbi decoder would not be the solution. And so that's what the, we, we had to come up with. Just, just to know a peak detector, what would that be? Suppose you are trying to decide you want to go, so I tried to do this uh, with the, the Lisbon map, but the Lisbon map doesn't have a nice grid. And I found that the, the roads go like that, circle back and forth, and so I had to go to a, a straightforward example. The Manhattan grid, and suppose you want to go from uh, one place uh, here, from Washington Square Park, to, to decide, shall I go to here to Madison Square or shall I go to Union Square? And suppose I'm going to make that decision based on the distance. The peak detector, you can think it's very simplistic. So it says, OK, I'll take the, the Euclidean distance, the straight, straight line distance between the two. Of course, uh, you, you, you might have problems with that. But then I might decide, well, I have a little time to go, so I'll decide to go to Union Square because the, the, the straight line distance is much smaller than the straight line distance to the other one. OK, great. But now suppose that you are a little smarter and you take into account the actual grid, okay? And now the problem is different. I want to go from point A to point B, okay? And I want to decide what's my route along the, the street map. And now you, the street map allows you to go, to go this in, uh, along an avenue and then cut to the right along a street and then go along another avenue. And so there are many alternatives. And uh, suppose that you make the decision still based on the distance, physical distance between point A and point B, but now physical distance measured along the map, along the grid map, okay? And I'm not taking here into consideration the one, one way. And so you could say I, I follow this red one and I add all the distance of all the little blocks that I cross, or I follow the orange one or the green one, and then I pick the best one. Okay, based uh, the shortest, the shortest in terms of distance. This you could, could do, it's much better than taking the straight line distance between points. Okay, but as you start shrinking or as congestion becomes a problem, okay, and that's what micromodeling would tell you, if you now start taking into account the fact that the cars go back and forth and cross and so forth, and then besides cars you have pedestrians and you have this and you have the, now the Uber Eats and the, all, all the Eats that you have here. If you start modeling all that, you get a very good understanding what's the time, which is the important metric, from going from A to B. And it's not necessarily maybe the red one that is the shortest in distance, note, notice also that the distance now are very close together. That's the problem, okay? But, uh, but congestion and time is what matters, okay? And that's the analogy with uh, what I'm saying is that, is that you have to look beyond the simple, uh, straight, uh, the simple Euclidean distance, which is what, quote, quote unquote, the Viterbi decoder does. Okay, the Viterbi says, okay, I go in little steps, I measure the distance traveled by each step, I add them up, I get the distance. Then I, I take another route, I add them up, I take another distance, I pick the best. What we are saying is, no, you have to take into consideration all these other things, except that now I cannot do the micromodeling, I cannot start seeing how many pedestrians are crossing the street or going along, how many bicycles and all that. And so you have to somehow come up with some other way, now that I understand I need to take into account that, I cannot apply Viterbi directly. And so the idea was, okay, what I'll do is uh, as I go along, and I can't tell you all the details, but uh, as I go along, 
I will have real-time measurements. I measure the time that I'm taking as I cross. Okay, so suppose I decide to go in a straight line. Then I start seeing that as I go along, there is a lot of traffic. Okay, then I better turn right. And now I'm better. Then I turn left. And again, I see that there is a lot of traffic. Then I turn right. So we made it signal dependent. It's, I, we made it dependent, the Viterbi decoder, instead of us using the metric of physical distance, we use the equivalent of a time congestion, of, of, of the time I take to walk or to, to, to go along that direction, okay? And that accounted in a very aggregated manner for all these other things, okay? And so we then essentially developed uh, an, an algorithm, and now I use the KM detector, or K dash detector, because that's how the, the industry uh, or the people that infringed used, used, okay? And so the only thing I want here is that we had a way of uh, updating the distance as we went along, okay? The congestion, taking into account the congestion and so forth. And so there is some math there, we don't care. So we, we wrote a patent, and now I must tell you that a patent has about 30 pages. The first 25 or 26 describe the problem, the context, and they are important. But the key is what's got, called the claims. Now, the, these two patents each had like 30 claims. It turned out that you can't defend 30 claims in a, in a, in a trial, okay? And so the lawyers looked at those 30 claims and they said, okay, on the 839, we are gonna only assert claim four. And this is claim four. Okay, out of the 30, they picked one. And uh, on the 180, they picked two. And this, these two claims essentially say it's a Viterbi-like, so it's not a, de a Viterbi detect, it's a Viterbi-like, and that has a certain meaning, uses several samples of the signal, not just one like the peak detector, uses several to compute what the Viterbi, uh, in the Viterbi language, is called branch metric functions. It's computing them. The Viterbi is a very simple formula that is the same across all the blocks of the, the path that you follow. Here, you have to adapt that, and so, but still, the, 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 it's a signal-dependent branch metric, and uh, uh, then applies that uh, to a plurality. Uh, the, the yellow things are the key things that were the matter of uh, gigantic uh, battle in, on trial, okay? What do these, these words mean? And does, does what Marvell implement uh, copy this, which was what we were saying, or what they say, no, no, this, uh, we don't do that, we do something else, okay? And so, but the, what I'm trying to say is that in a patent that is a very complex document, the person that writes the patent, which is a lawyer, uh, has to be a very smart person. Okay, has to be a very smart, because as I'll show you, there are contra contradictory things here. But before I do that, let me just tell you that CMU did file legal action in 2009. So 2009 is 12 years after, after the, the provisional was uh, filed, and about 1693 uh, to 2009 is 17 or 16 years after uh, Alec joined. And in a legal action, interestingly enough, there is a plaintiff, which in this case is CMU. There is a defendant, which in this case is Marvell. There is a judge, and we call the judge Honorable Judge, and uh, her name was Nora Fisher, an extremely careful person, and they have to be very careful because there is the higher level, uh, including up to the Supreme Court, that is looking over them and might say, you did something wrong. And so, <coughs> They have to be very careful. There is a district court, which is federal because this was uh, uh, the US government, not the state of Pennsylvania. So there is a federal district court of Western Pennsylvania. And then there is an appeals court that is the, in this case for the, uh, temp, uh, for the patents is called the circuit court. And then there are the lawyers. In our case, uh, it was a convergence of two law firms that happened exactly when we filed lawsuit that is now called the KL, KNL Gates, 
uh, and the number of lawyers was four principal lawyers and four uh, adjunct, four uh, helpers, help lawyers, plus a few others. So you see that there was a team behind. And then there is the lawyers for the defendant, uh, Queen Emmanuel Urquhart Sullivan. Sullivan was added during the name during the during the trial initially was just Queen Emmanuel. The only reason why this name, name is interesting is because when when trial started uh, in 2012 uh, in November 2012, uh, in the summer there was a big lawsuit between Apple and Samsung. Okay, and guess who was and and Samsung lost at the circuit at the at the trial. Uh, eventually they settled and uh, they agreed and no penalties. But Queen Emmanuel and Urquhart lost because they were defending Samsung. Apple won. And Apple won at that level a $1 billion. So it was a big super rule, okay? Apple won. And, and so these people, one month later, have to come to Pittsburgh, to the federal court, and defend Marvel. Of course, they were already involved with Marvel for for four, five years, three years, whatever. Uh, but they were coming full of energy. Okay. And one of the lawyers, it's interesting, the lawyer that actually during court uh, um, was the one that from their side that uh, was uh, uh, Dr. Mora. So what happened here and there and there was someone called Kevin Johnson. He was a uh, born and uh, raised in Canada, and the only way, I, the only thing I tell you this is because her mother was, uh, his mother was Portuguese. Okay, so <laughs> there were two Portuguese confronting themselves. It was an interesting tidbit. Anyway, besides the lawyers, there are the experts, and the judge had an expert. And for those of you in the field, you might know Dan Costello from the University of Notre Dame. He only was for a few months. Then the judge said, I already know everything. I don't need an expert. Then the plaintiffs, which is CMU, had a, a single technical expert. Steve McLaughlin now uh, is the provost at the Georgia Tech. Then there is a, a Bajorek. And uh, he was the uh, expert uh, explaining the industry, the disk drive industry. And uh, uh, Lawton, she was the business expert, was going to tell the, the, the jury, OK, here, the, this technology, the business that Marvel did, blah, 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 and the impact. And then there are the experts for the defense. And for those of you in the field, you might recognize Jack Wolf. Uh, Jack Wolf uh, is a very, very important person in information theory and, and uh, communications and blah, blah, blah. Uh, he was a professor at UC San Diego. He passed away during, during the trial. So he was initially helped by Proakis. Proakis is the guy that writes all these books uh, about very well-known person, very good friend, I must say. Blayhut, professor at Illinois, a, a, a great expert in coding theory. All these, Jack Wolf, Proakis, Blayhut, were quote, unquote, my best friends. And uh, we met uh, uh, during trial, and I would go to them and uh, shake their hand, and we would talk about everything except what was going on. <laughs> but Alec, who, is, uh, who has opinions, as I said, that are strong, he, he knew them very well. They were all much senior than him. He refused to talk to them. So, so different personalities. And uh, anyway, that's how it went. And uh, there are more people. There is, of course, the most important people are the juries. Okay, you have a jury, and the jury uh, is composed, I think, of uh, nine or ten people. And those nine or ten people are what's called uh, your peers. Okay, are people like you, except this like you, where. One was uh, an hairdresser, the other was a cooker, the other was uh, whatever. Okay, so you have to make, both, both sides have to make the case to these people that were picked by them. Okay, you see all these movies where people come, walk, sit down, and then the, uh, ask questions, and then no, out, out, out. Oh, this one is fine, agreeable by both sides. So it was. If, if you ever did, uh, in Portugal, you can also do juries, although, uh, although it's very uncommon. 
by the end of all this process, no matter if you win or lose, you become very appreciative of everybody involved, including the lawyers from the other side, okay? Because they reason at the level of each word, comma, and period, and all that, okay? And the jurors sit down there day after day. They are, they, they are paid like $5 an hour or something like that, so they lose a lot of money during the time they are there. And, and they are what's called sequestered, they can talk and blah, blah, blah. So it's a very involved and in the end you respect everyone, okay? Even those that were making the case saying that oh, what you are looking for is to become the whatever, okay? So anyway, um, I just want to tell you two things or three. What is the major, major thing? that uh, the CMU tries to tell the defender, the plaintiff to the defender, is that you infringed. This is my technology. You used it without asking me for permission. What is that, CM, uh, that, uh, that uh, the defender, Marvell, tells CMU? I did not infringe. What I'm implementing is, sli is slightly different. I, uh, you have these three or four conditions. I don't do condition one. I can do two, three, and four, but I don't do one, so I don't infringe. That's one. The other is, your patent is not valid. That claim is not valid because someone else previous to you already did something that falls under what you are saying, and so it's invalid. Your patent does not hold. And then the other thing is, your patent is not practical. It's the optimal detector. Optimal, you can't fit into the constraints of the application, so it's just a theoretical thing. I did a practical thing, so I don't. Uh, does not apply to me. So this, this is the argument that went back and forth, back and forth. And this also means that when you assert a claim, you have to think ahead. We as, uh, as experts, we don't think about these things, but the lawyer does, okay? So we describe to the lawyer with all the details, and here is the formula, and so the lawyer says, wait a minute, that's not what I want. And so if the claim is too narrow, if I put a lot of conditions, then it's very easy not to infringe, okay? Because I just skip the comma here and I'm done. But if the claims are too broad, I want to catch, it's like, uh, uh, I want to capture everything, okay? Then it's, it's invalid because someone that you didn't know of wrote a patent before or wrote a paper or, or um, said something and that something already applies to what you are saying. You cannot claim something from the past, okay? So these are the two things. They would say something, we don't infringe, your patent is invalid and is not practical. And we would say, no, our patent is very practical, is valid, and you infringe. And this went back and forth. And so, just to let you know, the detection usually, so the goal is you record data and now you want to read back that data. And that data uh, uh, usually is, the, the detector is broken into two steps. One is from the physical signal to bits, to a sequence of bits. That sequence of bits has, is, has errors, and then you do a second step of error correction, okay? Our only apply to the waveform detector. And, uh, and uh, what they did, uh, what, they, what uh, the industry was doing before our staff was they were using the Viterbi here, okay? And then they were improving here. But what happened is that with the technology, the semiconductor technology industry, uh, technology available at the time, what they were doing here, it was like the, the turbo codes for those of you who know, or the LDPC codes, very, very new and very powerful codes, but the technology made those things too expensive to implement, okay? And the chips that Marvell was building with these things, the, the, their own people in their internal documents would call that, oh, it's the coffee burner, because the chip was so hot that you could, you could uh, warm up your coffee, put in, that was what they said. And so that's why Marvell, in the successive uh, chips that they were offering to the industry in the late 90s and early 2000s, they could not 
win any, any uh, no, no one was buying a huge amount from them because they, they, they could not do it. And that's when in uh, the week be uh, between Christmas and the uh, New Year's Eve um, uh, in 2001, one of their engineers came across our paper and our patents and implemented it, writes a, an email to their boss to, and says, oh, look, I found this. This algorithm works very well, improves a lot this, and then we can use a more standard error correction, and we get what we want, which is uh, detects at the, the right uh, error, um, error rate. And, uh, and so if you do that, uh, oh, and by the way, the, this is patent. And so this is an email that uh, this person writes uh, to, to the boss. And of course, you know, whatever you say here, we can forget except it's being recorded. But if you write into a computer, you are doomed because it will be there forever. And so those things is what you recover, these and many others, during what's called discovery, okay? Where the, when you file the lawsuit, the judge says, okay, parties, now you have to give to the other party everything that relates to this, okay? And so they, they had to give and out. They, they only gave five million documents, okay? Hoping that buried in those five million documents, this email would be lost. But, uh, but there were other interesting things. For example, um, the, this is the paper I'm referring to. They would call their solution after 2001, the Kavchik detector, okay? They had in there, uh, uh, when they would refer in internal mails, till 2006, they would refer to that by the Kavchik detector. They had in their program something called a BM variable in the program. When you go through the code, it says BM variable, and they had a PM, a PM variable. And they claimed during court that BM did not stand for branch metric. So they were not computing a branch metric. But then why did they call the variable a BM variable? They were not computing a path metric. Then why did they call it PM? So there were these contradictions that were very hard for their lawyers to, to overcome, basically. So anyway, this goes. And so you see, uh, uh, we, we made uh, Marvel aware of the technology in 2003. The clock starts by US law at the time, now it's no longer like that, but at the time you had only six years to file a lawsuit. After six years, you lose, okay? Once, once the, the company says, oh, they sent me this letter. So that's 2003, the clock starts. CMU takes six years to file, almost to the day, okay? Almost the day before the, the latches uh, defense would kick in, latches is that period. CMU files. It was an internal uh, discussion. It was not easy because, of course, CMU was well aware this would, would be very, very expensive proposition. And also universities are not in the business of suing industry, okay? So, but this was such a blatant case that CMU eventually turned around and said, okay, if we don't defend this, why are we filing for patents? And so they decided to move, to move. Uh, the, the trial was uh, held uh, in, uh, started on the November 26, the day after Thanksgiving, the Monday after Thanksgiving, November 26 of 2012. It took exactly one month. The, the, the verdict, which is the decision of the jury, came out on December 26. So one day uh, after Christmas, a very snowy day in Pittsburgh. And then uh, there was uh, an appeal process. Uh, the appeal went, uh, uh, the, 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 the judge makes a decision at the federal, at the, at the initial court level. When it goes to the appeals court, it is called circuit. They don't make a decision, they, in, they, they say an opinion. So they, the, 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 the appellate court, the circuit court uh, uh, wrote their opinion in 2015 and eventually the settlement was uh, seven or, or eight months later on February 2016. And there are several um, interesting uh, uh, things here, um, um, but I'm not gonna go. So the verdict on December 26, so I came for Christmas here, 
Uh, I flew in uh, on the 23rd, which I think is a Friday. I arrived on the 24th. I was with the family over, and then on the 25th, I flew back. And then on the 26th, we were waiting. And then eventually, someone from court calls the lawyers and says, come in, because they reached the verdict. We walked into, and it's absolute silence. Those lawyers that had been screaming like hell during four or five weeks, now everybody's silent. And the judge says to, to the helper, I think they call it uh, Baylor, Baylor, Mr. So-and-so, uh, please walk in the jury. So the jury walks into the room and, and uh, sits down. Then the judge asks to the chief juror, I don't remember the name now, Mr. it was a man, Mr. So-and-so, did the jury uh, reach a verdict? Yes, Your Honor, okay. Mr. Baylor gets the verdict, uh, comes, comes with the, it's like a 15 page document with uh, 20 or 30 questions. And the judge looks carefully to each one. Okay, takes like 10 minutes and everybody is suspended. Then, okay, Mr. So-and-so, please read the, the verdict. And uh, it goes over and over and over and over and over. And the questions were all either yes or no. If they were yes, uh, I think that if they were yes, they were for CMU. If they were no, they would be for, uh, for uh, Markel, except one or two questions, okay? So uh, there were like 25, but the most important one was the 17th question, okay? So goes first question, yes. Second question, yes. Third question, yes. And so people are feeling. And then the question that was a no for CMU, we are all suspended because maybe the jurors were asleep and they just kept writing yes. But when it got to that question, it was a no. So we kind of were happy. And then they continued and they came to, the, to this question. Okay, and the question read, if you find that Marvel infringed either claim two of the 180 patent or both claim four, uh, whatever, of the 839 and claim two of the 180, and you found the infringed claim or claims to be valid, what amount of damage do you award CMU for the use of the patents? Okay. And they read the number 1,169,140,271 dollars, okay? <laughs> it was complete silence in, in the room. And they came to this number because we claimed that the, the infringement per chip was 50 cents, and so if you multiply this by two, you get the number of chips that at that time were infringed, uh, uh, Marvell was the major manufacturer, had eaten all the others, there were only two survivors at the time, and, uh, and they, they had a 60% share of the market of all computers, all these drives in the industry since about 2003, and so that's the number. The jury accepted 50 cents uh, per chip out of multiply that by 2,350,000, let's say, you come up with this number. And that was the, the thing. And then the, the Judge Fitch, Fisher took about a year and a half because uh, these things only become, uh, uh, only leave her uh, after one year and a half. She has to, to write uh, something and blah, blah, blah. Uh, there are motions uh, where the, the parties come and say, no, it's wrong, it's right, and blah, blah, blah. And eventually she wrote that. She affirmed the, the judge verdict. She gave a, a few more uh, damages, and then uh, uh, she gave uh, the total damages was this, and then she enhanced. She said, okay, I'm going to multiply that by 1.23. It could be up to a factor of three, but maybe the judge <laughs> said, okay, a factor of three, <laughs> really no. So uh, it's only 1.23 because that meant that Marvell infringed knowing they were infringing, okay? Knowing, and so you can triple the damages. She only said, no, 23% is okay. And so that raised to this, and then the, because she was only giving this a year and a half or, or, or a year and something after the verdict, there are uh, tax, there are um, uh, interest, okay? And the interest was 0.14%. And so it came out as this. Okay, out of her court, it came out. Of course, Marvell was not happy, 
CMU was not happy with the 23%, the, 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 the CMU wanted 300%, and so both, both parties appealed, okay? And uh, they went to the circuit court, so that's the appeals opinion that the circuit, and the circuit affirmed, affirmed and if you read this, what the circuit said, okay, it's valid, you did infringe, the 50 cents is true, the, the $2, the, but, but there is one thing, the 23% take it out, Marvell can claim that they didn't know. Okay, let's agree with them. So it went back essentially to the 1.1 billion. But but between now, between December 2012 and uh, and August 2015, Marvell had continued shipping uh, shipping chips. So this was back to about 1.5 billion by then. Okay. So Marvell got uh, uh, won on the aspect of the the willf, willfulness, the willfulness. So they they claimed that they didn't know. So and so they got that. We lost there. And uh, the circuit did one interesting thing. Out of the 2.5 billion, let's say by then chips, say that 400 or 500 had come to the U.S. and the others had gone to China, to Japan, and to all the, the other stuff. And that's one thing. And the other thing is that the chips were all manufactured in Taiwan, not in the US. So what did Marvell claim? Marvell claimed two things. First, they were uh, uh, given to the manufacturers in Taiwan. It's the manufacturers that brought them to the US. The Seagates of the world brought them into the US. We, we, are, what the, we don't care. We gave them in Taiwan. So the chips that came to the US did not infringe because in the, Marvell was not responsible for the infringement. That's, they lost on that. The chips that even did not come in the US, the patent is only valid for the US. How come you are now the chips went to Singapore to this and that? We don't uh, care about those. That's called extraterritoriality. Okay, and extraterritorial, what CMU claimed was, wait a minute, everything related to this, including the selling, the testing, the, the marketing, happened in the US. The Seagates of the world are one mile apart from the office of Marvell. Marvell has 7,000 people in whatever, Cupertino or wherever, while only has like 40 or 50 people outside. So everything happened in the US. And if so, the sales happen here, the extraterritoriality applies, which means the sale got here, so anything that uh, those chips were, they infringed. And the, the uh, Marfeld, of course, said the no, no, no. And then what the circuit said is, okay, regarding the extraterritoriality, which is about, let's say, out of the 2.5 billion, maybe 2 billion of the chips, did not come to the US. Then, Someone needs to define for us, circuit, where did the sale occur? Okay, now you think sale, okay, you go to the supermarket, you buy something, you, that's where the sale. Okay, so they remanded, they sent back to the, to the original and, uh, court and said, define for us sale. Where did sale occur? Okay, so when it gets back to Judge Norris Ship, uh, Fisher, Marvell is already responsible for 350 million. Okay, so CMU won that, at least at the circuit level. But there are about 1.2 billion that are, okay? And so, altogether is 1.5. And so, now the two parties have Marvell had said, we will pay zero. CMU said, okay, you'll pay 1.5. Now, the things are slightly different. Marvell has to pay say 350, CMU says 1.5. Judge Nora Fisher, say, the, the honorable Judge Nora Fisher, tells the parties, before we start a new trial, you parties go to mediation. Find a third, she appoints another judge, and the judge meets with the parties, they have to discuss and maybe they can reach an agreement. And that started, if I'm not mistaken, in October, and, um, and, uh, um, and, uh, by October 2015 and by February 2016, the parties reached the agreement 
and it was an interesting thing, and that's what the, the press released at the 4 p.m. at the February 17, and uh, uh, what did CMU did uh, with the money, and uh, of course the, it did lots of nice things, and uh, some of the things they did was they endowed the uh, fellowships called Presidential Endowed Fellowships for Students in perpetuity, meaning they put money aside, that money uh, is invested, generates income, and that income pays the tuition for 100 uh, students, undergrads and grads. They endowed, I think it's 20, I don't know, it's 40 or 20, I don't remember. That also means put aside a bunch of money, and uh, from the income, uh, you, you give titles to, to professors and uh, help, uh, help them with that money. The money for what's called moon, moonshot research projects. You have a great idea that is going to change the, the world. CMU every year um, uh, runs, runs these things, and so they put money aside, and the, the returns are for that. They did construction, uh, and of course, they did operating budget. They used in their uh, annual operating budget and uh, other things. And that's what, uh, what happens. This is the story. And uh, I'm sorry that uh, it took forever to tell you this story. Thank you very much. José, thank you very much for this wonderful, exciting story. Definitely, I was right when you uh, asked me which topic, this one or the story of the painting. Definitely, this story. So, thank you very much. I was right in uh, asking this. Um, you told me that uh, this is the first time that outside your group, you tell this story publicly. So thank you very much for that. It's an honor for that to read this. And one question. How did you realize that uh, Marvel or the, uh, the company uh, had changed the way the hard disks were performing? Because uh, that you missed that point, yeah. so that's a very interesting, uh, interesting point. So you are researchers, right? And uh, and uh, when you develop something, you think it's the best thing that ever happened since sliced bread. Okay. So we developed this detector, and uh, it's it's actually, as you know. It's a, a formal derivation. Once you assume a model, for us it's a formal derivation. And we could not imagine anyone to derive a better thing. So we call it the optimal detector. As you know, we abuse the word optimal, okay? It was the optimal detector. And then we were, uh, we were smart enough to, de to, de to develop a very practical implementation of the optimal detector. We knew by looking at that exponential curve that around the 2000s, 2003, 2002, when the patents came out, that the industry would be reaching the point where they could not do the Viterbi detector as it was. And so the natural thing was to do what we proposed. So we knew that the industry, we knew, I mean, we suspected that the industry was doing. That's the first. Okay, we, and we, we, were, we knew Marvell was uh, eating all the others, so we suspected maybe they are the ones and the others didn't catch up or something. Okay, that's the first. The second is, um, I'm going to make a claim. I have uh, a few students here, so I, I, I hope they don't uh, deny me what I'm saying. But usually when a student finishes a thesis, I step back and let the uh, 
the, the student um, own that area or that problem, okay? And so I stepped back, Alec continued to work on the, on the area. So Alec had the, is a great expert in these things and he had all these connections. And people would whisper, the people that bought the chips would whisper in his ear, Alec, they are using your technology, okay, Alec. But they could not be identified because there is what's called the non-disclosure agreements, NDA. So they could not say, well, we bought the chips, Marvell gave them to us to test and gave us the specs, but uh, they signed a thing saying they could not say anything, but they did say because they are, were outraged. Okay, and so, so these were the two things. One is we were convinced they were doing it, and there were whispers that we heard. And so now the question is, how do you convince CMU, the provost, the dean, the provost, the president, and the legal person, the legal, that based on whispers and based on your intuition that you are the best researcher in the world and so they should believe you, CMU should turn around and go against their principles of not suing industry and spend a lot of money which they don't have, okay? And that, that took six years and took the courage actually of the chief legal officer that she at some point said, we are going for it. So that was the, the story. Bom, eu, eu tinha duas perguntas, mas um, uh, I had uh, two questions, but one of them you anticipated my question because you told the story about Taiwan. <laughs> okay, now the, the question is, uh, uh, is the following. So running a patent office is extremely expensive for a university. So mostly you lose money on that for many and many, many years. Do you have an idea what is the final balance sheet of the patent office of CMU regarding taking into account all the expenses they had since they were uh, uh, initiated and uh, how they are doing right now because your patent is one of the most successful for universities in the world in terms of uh, uh, the, the money agreement. So it's interesting to know uh, th this balance in this case. So Luis, you are absolutely right. Okay, now well, let me go back to the extraterritoriality. Um, the Supreme Court is hearing now something about a lawsuit about extraterritoriality. And I think that uh, uh, the CMU case did not go to the Supreme Court of the US because it was settled, but it was going directly to the Supreme Court. Okay, and the Supreme Court took the case on another, another thing, and they made the ruling and the ruling, I think, gives reason to CMU, okay? So that's an apart on the extraterritoriality. The same thing with Leches. Marvell also said that, oh, they waited six years, so, so forget about this, they don't make chips, why are we bothering with this? The Supreme Court did hear another case on this and also decided that Leches does make sense throw away the, that window and uh, you can wait 20 years and file a lawsuit. The only thing you can only do is claim within a window of six years, but you still have the right to file, okay? While before people, if they waited six years and one day they could no longer file a lawsuit. So that's on, the, on those issues. Now, this, the question that you ask is a very interesting one. And this is like an investment that universities do, okay? And there are two, so, so uh, I'll come back to the money wise, but let me tell you something. Universities, um, um, so they, they partner with the industry, okay? And uh, one, one of the things they like to show to, to industry partners is that they have this portfolio of technology that is accessible to them, okay? So it's, it's like a bonus for the industry to come and work uh, with universities. So that must be factored into the global budget of the, of the university. Uh, but more importantly, um, the universities make, the, the patent office is always 
uh, going after industry, okay? Companies, small companies, large and so forth. And they try to license and get small royalties, large royalties, whatever it is. And so what I know is that uh, CMU, they do rankings for everything, right? CMU at the time, not after the patent, but before the patent, was ranked number three in terms of the money they could get out of their patent office. Okay, so they do make money. Uh, uh, they don't make uh, hundreds of millions, but they make money. They and uh, and uh, um, but they are very careful in terms of the number of patents. Okay, they 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 argue with you and and all that. Um, why should we patent this? Show us the case, and then after the patent issues, they are always coming back to you. And so, I know that I know that that universities um, do do make money. Uh, not uh, well in the medical arena, they make a lot of money. Okay, they make a, in the IP in the IT areas, they don't make as much. But uh, I guess after, after CMU's case, I think that, um, that more and more universities are doing it. Yeah, but it's expensive. And I would advise IST to actually start thinking strategically because if you have a portfolio of patents, it makes the case for companies to pay attention to what the researchers at, CM, at um, IST do. Okay. Th thank you very much. It was a very impressive talk, very inspiring. So I have uh, two questions. So one, uh, I was uh, a bit uh, maybe expecting that, uh, so once you suspected that the industry could be using your ideas, I would expect at that time that CMU could approach the industry to see if they would be interested to license and so if you could comment why either that happened or why didn't it happen and so on. So the other question was uh, I mean, on I mean, this amazing uh, I mean, story about uh, the research versus the application and the impact in the industry and then all the legal aspects of this. So, has this changed, in a way, uh, the way you, you, you uh, supervise your doctoral students and how you uh, guide them whether to write patents or not and, uh, in a specific way? So what is the, which lessons you learned and how did that influence this uh, aspect of uh, your work with your students? Thank you. It's a very interesting uh, the, the two, two questions. No, when I talk about the latches and the six years, it's exactly because the patent, the second patent issued sometime in 2002, and in 2003 we had a meeting at CMU, um, the DSSC director and the, the legal and the, the, the technology transfer, and uh, Alec uh, at that time he was at Harvard. Myself, we had a conference call. What do we do with this? And what came out was we are going to approach the companies and tell them these two patents issued, so why don't we start talking, okay? And Marvell, of course, was approached, and that's why they receive a letter, I don't know if uh, maybe uh, if, the f if we filed in March of 2009, maybe in April or May of 2003, they received a letter which of course they completely ignored, okay? They didn't react to the letter, they didn't approach. There were other companies that we approached that wrote back and said, we are no longer in that business or we buy the chips to someone else, we don't need uh, your technology, okay? But uh, so, so we did approach and that's, uh, that's why we had uh, one, um, one thing to force CMU to, to decide because the clock was click, cl uh, was ticking, and so there was that deadline. After um, April 2009, forget it. We couldn't do anything because of this uh, six year thing. On the other question, yeah, I think that, uh, that um, I did change. So um, in, my, in, my, in my doctoral thesis, I was doing underwater acoustics. We were listening 
to submarines 5,000 kilometers away. Okay, that was what Ventries and Bagram, my advisors at MIT, said. Jose uh, developed for us a good detector for this. Now, the sound travels 5,000 kilometers. The subs were coming out the, from the Baltic Sea. You had all the arrays along the east coast of the US. They received these signals. And uh, OK, of course, I didn't develop the detectors for that. I did some math and blah, blah, blah. OK. I didn't test it in the real world, OK? It was for the Navy to do that, but not for me. So it was highly theoretic. When I came to, the, to, to Portugal, Isabel, Carlos Bell, Vitor, and others, it was all right. But whatever we did, Isabel went and said, OK, this I did, but now I want to do real things moving around. And Victor said, OK, I do these things, but I really want to do wireless communication and all that. So I'm going to claim here that I planted the seeds. It's a complete lie, what I'm saying. But I'm going to say that. OK, so that's not true. Now, when I went to CMU, I radically changed my attitude because I wrote for four years proposals that were all rejected. And they were rejected because people would read my stuff and say, this seems to be a math thing, and this guy is an engineer not in a math department, so why should we give uh, him the money and not to someone else? Okay? And, uh, and that's what I learned with the DSSC and uh, other things, is that you need really to anchor your research in some realistic problem of the real world, work with the experts that know that, and then find, the, find your solution, and then close the loop and work with some real data. Now, in your field, you always have real data because you have a camera, right? You put the camera, you have the real data. Uh, my field at the time was not like that, so there was a real experimentation to collect signals from a hard, uh, so, I must tell you that uh, we still have uh, students that do a lot of theoretical work. I always tell them you have to find an application, and uh, many of them do lip service to the application. They say, okay, imagine this scenario. The scenario is very abstract, and they are very successful because they are very good. But many other students, yeah, they, they, they do. So I am a true believer that you should start from the real world, do some nice math, and then test back on some real signals. Now, my application has nothing to do with the, the people that work in the real world, okay? That address real, show it working, okay? So I am very junior with respect to some senior people like Manuel is sitting there, Isabel sitting there, they, they re, or you sitting there. You, you really work. Mine is a little bit removed, but anyway. <laughs> I, I, I know my, my limitations, Isabel. <laughs> and may, maybe I can tell something from my, my experience. Okay, so good. You have been colleagues here in the... In the oh, uh, what do you mean colleagues? You were my student. Yes, no, <laughs> at the very beginning. And we, we received the, 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 the degree at, uh, by the end of... Uh, Sixty-nine. 69 yeah. Yeah. Then we went to the MIT. I went to to, to Germany, and, came, and, we, and we came back, and um, we, you were already uh, at that time a professor, and uh, I was an assistant. And you told me, "Oh, look, I have this problem, a nice problem, because and this is exactly two for you," and uh, I agreed. And the, the problem was the following. Uh, he told me, there is a device which is called PLL, it's a phase lock loop, which is a really very good in uh, synchronization problems, but it fails uh, when the, the noise reaches a certain threshold. Uh, and uh, uh, the problem is, uh, can we do better than this? Can we apply and develop an algorithm that is able to take advantage of the, all the information 
Or in other words, instead of simplifying the, the problem, you could uh, take advantage of uh, all the information you have about the problem and uh, uh, um, perform some um, improvement on, on the, the algorithms and the, the, the receiver. And we did that. And in, uh, uh, in uh, 82, we presented um, a communication in the International Symposium on uh, uh, Information Theory in uh, Les Arcs. Uh, and uh, that was uh, about something like experimental uh, phase uh, acquisition problem, or experimental studies and, and in phase acquisition. In the same session, Viterbi, Viterbi was there and uh, presented with uh, his daughter a, co uh, a communication on phase optimal phase estimation for digital communication, things like that. Okay, uh, finishing the, the, conf the conference in the bus down the, the, the mountain, uh, the uh, chairman, they were two, uh, were sitting close to us and speaking loud, and one of them uh, asked the other, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you feel about the, the, the conference, I mean the session? And yeah, I liked it, especially the, the Viterbi and Viterbi. Uh, they, they, they've done a, a very good job. Uh, it's, it's nice. And the, other, and the other one answered, well, but the Portuguese, have you seen what the Portuguese have done? They have tried to, uh, to solve a uh, not yet solve problem. So phase acquisition or something like that. And then the others, yeah, but the, yeah, Viterbi was, and Viterbi was at that time already well known from, from the Viterbi decoding and all, all the, the other important works of him. And um, then the, the other guy came again. Well, but we have to, to, to look at the solutions and the way they, they, they have dealt with the, uh, this problem of phase estimation. And, uh, and we d didn't say anything. At the end, uh, walking on the, on the, the street in, uh, in Geneva, uh, uh, José told me, you told me, so you, you see later, uh, we should have patented this, <laughs> this, this small trick, this small uh, discovery that is inside the, the, uh, the, the, the problem that makes, that makes it possible and it, it works o online because of that and so on and so on. But we didn't. Uh, but we didn't. Uh, later, later in, uh, in, the, in the early 80s, um, the, another story, and this, the story you have um, started. And the problem was, again, uh, sophisticate the models, try to get the maximum as, as you can from the models, preserve all the information you, you, you can, and uh, sophisticate also uh, your detector. In this case, it was an improvement on the Viterbi decoding, uh, modeling, all uh, adaptations, uh, I mean, uh, parameter estimation, all those things. So, uh, so that's my, well, I only wanted to, to tell more or less what was my experience uh, in trying to do better than what's possible until there. Okay? A missed opportunity. Sorry? <laughs> it was a missed opportunity. Yes. Oh, well, I don't know, because uh, uh, the, the, you, you started with a very demanding already problem, and well-defined, you had to reach that, more or less. And uh, this kind of thing was somehow more academic. We did it because you liked it. Okay, and there was a consequence of your, 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 your work in, in, uh, in, uh, in MIT, and also you applied this, this thing in another water acoustics with background. There is a publication on that. Okay, that's it. Um, I think that uh, we should end. Oh, one more question. And then we should call it uh, the day. Thank you for the talk. I just wanted to know that if 
uh, marvel instead of willfully um, using your patent without uh, acknowledging it. If they had followed the legal path and used the patent uh, legally, do you have any idea of how much it would have cost them? Yeah. Um, so you are talking about royalties. So if they had come to us in 2004 or three and say, okay, let's negotiate royalties. Okay, so let me tell you something. The way a trial, in trial you come back with the value of the infringement, in this case, 50 cents per chip, is by what's called a, a, a negotiation, a virtual, uh, the, the legal term, I, now I'm missing the legal term, but it's like virtual, a virtual negotiation. So the parties in 2012 argued and that's, that's uh, how the Supreme Court in the U.S. decided that these things are decided in court to, f to find the, the inferior. Is you put yourself back in 2003 or 4 when you sit around the table and you negotiate what is the rate. Okay? But what our business expert came up with to come with the 50 cents was this. If we were back in 2004 or three, um, we, in a fair conversation, we would all have access to the, nego to, the, to the marketing and to the business of Marvell with respect to these chips, okay? And so what she claimed, our expert, was that Marvell went to Seagate and Western Digital, which are two manufacturers of disk drives, before with uh, some chips, and they valued the chips, let's say, for $4, okay, per chip. And then after they incorporate the technology, so six months later, they went back to, to, to Seagate, and they charged 4.5 by the new version of the chips, okay? And so what our experts said is that, look, the only difference, and she had to study and she had access to the chips, the only difference between this chip and this chip is that they did the signal dependent detector, okay? And so she claimed the value is because, look, they sold this many for so many millions and they sold this many for so many million. So divide by this, it's 50 cents. That's the way they, they did. And so now, do go back, do go back in real time. It would be impossible to negotiate with, uh, with uh, the manufacturer, nor would be CM, CMU would be eager to license the technology, okay? And... Uh, Marvel would have said, we'll become members of the DSSC, we'll give you $500,000 or $300,000 per year for five years, and that's shake hands and that's it. So it's completely different when you do a priori, you, don't, you are a honest player, you approach others versus, and that was one argument they said, look, if we had negotiated this, you'd have charged us, what? Peanuts. So how, how come, are you, are you crazy? But then we use the legal standard of that virtual negotiation and then you show, and that's what the jury has to accept, is this true or not? That's, that's a, a very intricate and complicated thing. Well, I think we still almost reaching the end. Uh, maybe one last, one last question. Yeah, yes, go. I, I have a question regarding the first context you gave uh, with, with your research. Um, and that in the United States, no, you stated this research association no, um, was funded no, to advance, uh, to regain the leadership, the technological leadership. And um, so, 
do you think so this was achieved because uh, at the end no, academia, academia and industry both seem to um, the end of the story is both gained with this no? could this be also a blob or some example maybe also for other countries like Portugal and um, yeah this this is a question so and also this interchange very interesting between industry and academia no? as you also mentioned the importance no, to exchange of the people no? and could you just comment on this thank you I understood well the question. The question is, uh, is uh, um, was there any real success in terms of uh, the industry surviving or improving or whatever? Well, in the disk drive industry, certainly, certainly, if you look uh, at uh, most disks, um, I've not uh, accompanied the, the market and so forth, but Seagate and Western Digital and maybe Toshiba are the the companies that uh, that uh, in the disk drive industry these are the major things and uh, in the us the the proposal the, the initial proposal for the dssc which was a, a five uh, a factor of five increase uh, was rejected the first time two years later of course as good professors we came back and said now five years five times is too small, we promised 10 times. Okay, so in the next five years, we are gonna uh, grow the, the recording devices and so forth to be 10 times more powerful. It was achieved, it was achieved, and, uh, and, uh, um, and the DSSC and people in the DSSC working with companies and then uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the initial success that was achieved, convinced the US government through the Commerce Department to start other programs for industry that actually in, in uh, the early 2000s, and that's that, that uh, exponential curve, in the early 2000s led to a factor of 10 over what was achieved in, 2000, in, the, in, uh, in the early 2000s. So uh, um, in the early in the early, in the 2012 or 13 or 14, it was already like 100 gigabits per square inch, what we promised initially to be one gigabit and then 10 gigabits. So there, the, that's a success story. Not, not because of me, but because of the DSSC and the Crider, the, his vision and all the, all the people and working together and the industry stepping back and say, okay, we are competitors, but there are things where we should, uh, we should. and there are uh, several other examples within that industry. On the semiconductor, the SRC is a great success story because you see that uh, Intel is still around uh, and now the, the, the NVIDIAs and, uh, and uh, the chip designers and so forth, although the manufacturer is all in Taiwan, okay? The fabs, are all in Taiwan, but Qualcomm, for example, dominates the world of the communication chips and so forth. So, and the, and the, and the thing is that not just the technology, but also Japan in the 90s, or maybe 2000s, went through a, a, a big economic crisis, okay? So they lost track. And you can even see Apple with, uh, what's the name of the device? The I, the i um, not the iphone the other one for music the ipod right the ipod in 2003 or 4 smashes sony okay and so now the semiconductor industry in the us although with a lot of competition and so forth from china and from uh, from the the cycle is repeating with uh, we have talked about the role of huawei and all that and 5g and so forth it's highly competitive the 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 market but uh, but i think i think th the the play field is is more balanced now well thank you very much to all okay. of you and uh, for your patience and the staying. End. Thank you. Thank you.